Hey, dear friends of worldyouthday.com. Hey, we're very blessed to celebrate an amazing year in the history of the church. Today marks the 500th anniversary of the conversion of St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Society of Jesus, also referred to as the Jesuit Order. As we continue this series on the lives of the saints, today I want to focus on this amazing saint who by far changed the course of history from the moment that he was born in the late 1400s to the moment that he rose into becoming one of the greatest saints of the Middle Ages. Today, I'm blessed to have with me one of my good friends that I met at World Youth Day in Panama. Father Christian Sanz is uh, the a professor of theology at St. Vincent de Paul in, a Seminary in Boynton Beach. Father Christian, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, what a pleasure to be able to have this time with you to talk about one of your favorite saints, right? St. Ignatius. Indeed, yeah. St. Ignatius is the founder of the Society of Jesus, the order to which I belong to. And uh, we're coming up on a really uh, significant and important date that's uh, going to be on the 20th, the today to 20th, is the conversion of St. Ignatius of Loyola. It's kind of well, interesting. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, there's all there I could think of saint that we celebrate the conversion. We have this conversion of St. Paul. That, that, that's a major feast. And in, in, in Rome, as you know, Daria, I mean, it, it's a big feast. You go to St. Paul's Basilica. Uh, outside the walls and you know it, there's uh vespers and the pope will attend and so it's kind of interesting and this is new i mean because it's 500 years so you don't get that too often and uh we kind of called it this the conversion of saint ignatius and we're going to celebrate this feast day in mean, the society of jesus in a very solemn way the whole year is marked off for this occasion uh where we recall that 500 years ago a soldier a, a young soldier a spanish soldier who was fighting in Navarra outside of Pamplona against the French, was shot in the leg. He got a cannon shot and was disabled, taken out of the battle. Eventually, he was uh, carted back home to the Basque country where he was from and uh, underwent a very long uh, convalescence there, recovering from this wound, which, well, he didn't really always recover from it. He, he stayed limp the rest of his life. And... Uh, during that time, this soldier who was very worldly, in his own words, given to the world and everything that it had, turned around. And we leave an Inigo, a soldier, Inigo de Loyola, becomes eventually Saint Ignatius of Loyola. A total conversion, even his name changed. And that happened 500 years ago at that battle on May 20th. Uh, in Pamplona. And so we're celebrating what was the outcome of that conversion because 500 years later, we have what is still, we could be considered the largest single order in the uh, Catholic Church, religious order, the Jesuits, who have got a very uh, colorful history throughout the, uh, the history of the church. It is one thing that I, that I teach at the seminary, the, the history of the church as well. And, and that is a uh, you know, big chapter is the Jesuit uh, contribution to that history, particularly in the time when we talk about the Reformation, the Counter-Reformation, and up until recent history as well. Let's take a look at that when Ignatius was in, you know, in the hospital, because something that really strikes me even to today to the modern young person, right? How alone he was in the hospital bed. His friends rarely visited him. He had no one and it wasn't until he he got a book, wasn't it? I mean, a, a book on the mm -hmm. lives of the saints that he started yes. reading and he started realizing. Mm -hmm. And I think of like people today, especially during this pandemic, right, where they just have been isolated, some out of fear, some out of concern, right, closed up. With it. Very rarely was there a public mass. I mean, now things have, are reopening up worldwide. But <laughs> we saw a lot of a lot of, you know, darkness, especially mental health and spiritual health, darkness. This darkness Ignatius experienced, but he was able to overcome it. Tell us a little bit about how he overcame it and then ultimately how that change occurred in him. Well, 500 years ago, when he received that wound, it shattered his leg and uh, the lower part of his leg. And the field surgeons did what they could to place it back in again, and they carted him away. However, we know it didn't settle well. We have a lot of details because St. Ignatius actually dictated his own autobiography. And so he, we have very vivid accounts firsthand of what happened and, 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 this, uh, and this life of St. Ignatius. And he recalls that when he 
had been attended to in the field hospital and was carted back home. Already kind of a, a, a welt or a kind of a knob was forming where the bones were settling and they weren't settling correct. I mean, think about it. It was a, a field hospital, an emergency. It wasn't the best technology you can imagine. In the 1500s. Care. Yeah, in the 1500s. So yeah. you know, they don't really have antiseptic or anything uh, of that sort. And uh, to tell you a little bit about his character before he looked at it. And again, being a young military officer, which he was, you know, it was his, practically his first command and it resulted in a loss. The, the French won that war, uh, that, that battle. So he was kind of taken away in shame, having lost and being pulled out of uh, the battle, being an officer and being injured, the first one out. Uh, looking at himself and seeing that knob on his leg, he said, I will never be able to use my riding boots again. How am I supposed to be an officer or, or, or a knight without the proper uniform? And so he ordered them on the way to cut that part of the bone and shave it down and reset the leg, break it again and reset it. And he underwent the pain again and definitely the, uh, the, 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 the anguish of having that done to him a second time. Well, they did reset the leg. They did eliminate a little bit of that knob. However, now one leg was shorter than the other. So he was going to be hobbling for the rest of his life. But so much was his mindset. And he recalls this as uh, in, in, in his story of his conversion, that this is how much given to the world he was. All he cared about was his appearance afterwards. How am I going to look in uniform with, you know, with a bad leg? And, you know, how am I going to fit into my boots? What are people going to look at me? Oh, my hair, I need to grow. I need to be able to use everything that I've had before. And so he had this kind of sense of uh, shame or, you know, perhaps even call it today depression. And it seemed that his life was pretty much over the way he knew it. So when he gets home to the castle in, in, uh, in, uh, in Loyola, where he's from in the Basque country, to pass the time, and again, he's, he's bedridden for months as yeah. he uh, recovers and is able to get traction again. And uh, he was asking for entertainment. And again, obviously, there's no TV or anything back then. The only thing to do is read. And so, well, what he wanted to read, kind of what he read when, it was, when he was younger or the tales that would inspire him to get back up and recover. And so he wanted knight's tales. Give me anything that had to do with knights, that dealt with war, that dealt with heroics. Yeah, I, I need to liven my spirits. The best thing they could find for him was the life of Christ <laughs> or the anima Christi in there. The, so the best they could do was find the imitation of Christ for him. And that definitely is no knight's tale. And so seeing that he had nothing else to read, he started reading that. A life of Christ, the imitation of Christ. And he started to take it in and actually take it in seriously. So much that when he finished reading through it, he read it again and, and he started asking people, Give, what else is there to read? Give me something else. Well, we got the lives of the saints here. Give me that. And he started reading the lives of the saints as if they were knights themselves. And he started seeing them that way. These are the knights of Christ. This is the militia, uh, militia Christi. I want to be part of this. I can do this. And more and more, he just started forgetting and leaving behind those worldly pursuits and, and, and desires and really getting engrossed into the lives of the saints, wondering that if Saint so-and-so could do this, so could I. Why not me? And if there's so many good things and so, uh, that happened to Saint whoever he was looking at, and if Christ were like a commander and this saint was his low soldier, well, I could do the same thing too. How much better would it be to be a soldier of Christ than the soldier of a king, an earthly king? And that actually becomes one of the meditations of the uh, spiritual exercises where we meditate ourselves, how we present ourselves before our earthly kings. We don't have kings anymore, but we do have men that we put in the place of a king a lot of times. It could be our boss, sometimes our teachers or whoever. They become our kind of our earthly kings. And we're at the service, not because we don't want to, because we want to sometimes. So he compares, how much am I willing to give for another man that leads me? And how much am I willing to give for Christ who also leads me? It's one of the uh, reflections of the spiritual exercises. So when, when we and talk so, about conversion, though, mm -hmm. from that point, you know, we, we have a story of St. Francis who literally get, you know, strips off his clothes. Then you have the story of St. Paul who's blinded and knocked off his high horse. What was like the traumatic turn turning point for Ignatius? from after reading these stories, like when did it begin for him? 
a couple of things happen. I mean, one is he gets uh, totally pulled into these stories. And again, he's, he's come with helpless. He can't go anywhere. And uh, we see he has a tremendous imagination that, you know, he starts really to picture these lives and places himself before, beside the life, life of Christ as if you were accompanying him. Certainly, that's a moment of communion. It's a moment of prayer. Maybe he doesn't know it at the moment, but it is. He's going through a contemplative prayer at that moment through meditation. And later on, he'll figure out this is what it is. But I think that's the first step of conversion for St. Ignatius and the way he learns to pray, maybe in a way he had never done for, before in his life. And then the second thing happens that he does call, recall an apparition of St. Peter kind of appearing to him and pointing him to the way you are being called to this, or to this militia. You who want to serve someone, serve my king, serve Christ. And he takes it mm -hmm. seriously. And so that totally changes his life, that when he finally does recover and he's got his, his wits about him and whatnot, he does a pilgrimage right away, which would have been typical at that time, you know, from recovering from something uh, uh, maybe life-threatening or life-changing, going on pilgrimage to a local shrine. And he does that. He goes to Aransasu, which is just north of where he is, up in a beautiful mountain. And it's quite a walk to get up there. I've been there once. <laughs> uh, to visit the image of the Virgin that's there. And in that pilgrimage, again, even more, he's confirmed he's got to take a different path of life. Now, he's still pretty young, especially by our standards. He's still pretty young, so he's still deciding his life. And so he decides there he's going to leave a life for Christ. He's got to do something. He's, he, he's going to go on another pilgrimage. And so there he starts moving away from where he is because you know, his family is a noble family. There was an expectation of him to continue what he was doing to ser serve the king or, uh, you know, continue in the family estate and whatnot. And he felt totally called to live the life of the saints that he had read in poverty, uh, in begging alms, uh, in asking for alms and simplicity. And in and this spiritual reflection that it's kind of sounds like the hermits or the desert fathers that retreat from where they were and to go find solitude and find God there. And that's exactly what he does. He comes back home packs up his bags, leaves basically all his wealth there. His brother can't have that. You know, he's, he's kind of known locally. And so he gives him a horse and he gives him a servant to go with him. And he leaves to Montserrat, which is down in, uh, uh, in Catalonia, which is the sacred place, place where there have been uh, monasteries for centuries already there. It was already uh, another shrine of the Virgin Mary up there as well. And his idea is, let me go down there and make a pilgrimage there and it takes him however long it takes him. And along the way, he has his adventures, I guess. And uh, what he gets there, he spends all night in vigil before the, the image of the Virgin there. And he surrenders his arms. He leaves a sword and a dagger, which you know, he was entitled to have as, as, a, as a soldier, as a, as a, as a knight. And um, you can say that probably there's another phase of his conversion there his previous life or his previous identity as a soldier, he now leaves at the altar of the Virgin and he's no longer El Caballero, this, this, this horseman, this, this knight anymore. He's just going to be known as Inigo. And he leaves pretty much a beggar from there. He dismisses the servant that his brother gave him. He even trades his horse for a donkey as a horse is considered something uh, luxurious there and continues on his way on his own from there on and finds a cave in the town nearby, in the foothills of, the, of that area of Montserrat and Manresa. And this is where he spends several months and where he ends up composing what we call today the spiritual exercises. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, it, it sounds a lot like some of the spiritual exercises of just this abandoning of self, of, of the attachments that we mm -hmm. have with his daily examines that he would undergo you know, every day trying to figure out what else is, is, is in the way, what else do I need to get rid of? so that I can be free from the chains of this life that I've lived all my years. When does he take on the motto AMDG? And then you can elaborate a little bit on that. Cause that is it, is it before he starts the, the society or is it as he approaches Rome and then confronts the Holy father and says, I, I want to start this society. Um, where does it all begin there for him? I think it, it, it's traced down to perhaps in composition of the spiritual exercises. Cause you find it phrased in different ways, but it's there. In, 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 in several parts. Right at the beginning, it's the thing that's called the principle and foundation. And it's the opening premise, let's say, for the spiritual exercises. And, and it's in there already. And he says that all creation 
everything that's created is at my disposal to be used for the greater service, reverence, glory of God. And so creation in itself, he sees, is something good. It comes from God, and it is meant, it's capacitated to serve him. And so discernment at the end of the day, and that's one of the main kind of themes of the spiritual exercises, is to learn how to use those things that are given to me in the world for the greater glory of God. So it comes out there in one way. And then there's this other prayer also that St. Ignatius is known to, uh, known to have that is derived from that. Uh, it says the ordering of operations that may all my intentions, my thoughts, my actions today be purely ordered for your divine service and majesty and greater glory. And so that becomes kind of like the summary of, uh, of, uh, of uh, your motivations, uh, that everything we do be for the greater glory of God. We see it in the Jesuits in a way that the order is not really, there's no official apostolate to the order. Even though it's known for education, and you know, if you kind of hear Jesuits, the first thing you're going to think of, oh, universities, schools. Yeah, yeah the, but it's not, we're not limited to that. It just became that, that, it happened that that becomes now the kind of the principle. But in the order itself, nowhere says we must have schools. We can do whatever glorifies God. So whether you're an astronomer, you can be a doctor, even a lawyer, they're Jesuit lawyers as well, engineers even, whatever. If you can bring glory to God through what you do, you're free to do it. And so, for example, in my case, I, I study history and, and history became my, my, my profession. I do find a, a way of glorifying God through the study of history, believe it or not. Some people who don't like history will be like, <laughs> I didn't get what you're saying, Father. Like, well, don't worry. <laughs> Everyone finds his own way to glorify the Lord. I, I find it through history, uh, through the study of Latin as well. And so my purpose says, go with it. You, 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 you go on with that so now that now that he's kind of jotting down these spiritual exercises what kind of you know a lot of people probably wonder why not just join one of the orders that's already there i mean you have the benedictines you have the dominicans who are being established during the same time the franciscans mm -hmm. have been around for a little bit longer um the carmelites as well w why start a new order like what what mm -hmm. was uh ignatius looking at that he just said, you know what, there's a lot of great things out there, but I think something more is needed. Mm -hmm. And this is what I am going to be starting with this order that I want to establish. Yeah, it, indeed, this happens. And it's a kind of a paradigm shift. It happens pretty much right it, it, at the moment the Protestant Reformation is happening. And there's a movement that already preceded all of this that was called Devotio Moderna. And more and more, we started seeing the, uh, how can I say, this the, the notion between uh, of of religious life kind of changed. What governed it, the Benedictines, as you mentioned, even the Franciscans and the Dominicans, was the principle of fuga mundi. We're leaving the world. Right. What is here? There's sin. There's crime in the city. What is in the world does not help me. Get the guy. I have to leave it. So you've got your priories out in the beautiful, you know, mountains in in uh, Umbria near it. So, I mean, it's a place you go to nature, uh, even the, the Dominican priors, you try to set them out somewhere else. All the, the Benedictine monasteries, they're out in the yeah. valleys. They're in nature. Why? Because, well, the city, you weren't going to find anything good there. You had to leave it. By this time, and St. Ignatius is kind of part of it. He didn't invent this, but he was just part of his time, uh, a movement of his time, was to return to the city. And the mentality was not so much that we got to run away from the city because this is, or the world because this is where sin is, but we got to go there because that's particular, exactly where sin is. We got to change that. And mm -hmm. so apostolic orders are born at this time. St. Ignatius wasn't the first one, but he was part of a couple of them that were starting at the same time. And the idea was we're, we're not leaving the city, we're going back into it. Uh, we're not rejecting so much the world as we're going to use what's in the world to combat sin and combat the devil in it. And so it's a re-engagement of, sort of the world. There were other pretty much at the same time that had the same idea. The Theatines, for example, were founded at pretty much at the same time the Jesuits were being founded and, uh, and other movements as well. St. Phil uh, Philip Neri, his oratorians are basically doing the same thing at the same time, just a little bit later. And so there's this movement again now, not Fuga Mundi, but engage the world. And you know, taking that, that, that part of the gospel, light the world on fire, yeah, literally, do it, go back and re-engage. I, I love also the fact that the Jesuits, you know, when, when Ignatius is starting this idea, is that he doesn't decide to, you know, abandon the idea of also the close of the world. I mean, he literally 
the what I'm wearing is how I'm going mm -hmm. to reach out to you and connect with you. I'm not going to wear something different to make me stand out because I don't want to stand out. Mm -hmm. I want to be with you to walk with you. It almost mm -hmm. seems like a, a, a Pauline motivation. I find that very, very successful for the sake of Ignatius, especially because he's dealing with a very heavy period of time. I mean, you mentioned the Reformation. Tell me a little bit more on that, because I mean, ideally, he, he has this idea of no more fuga mundi, which is definitely understandable, because now we have to head on. He, he, I like his approach. I mean, he's the military tactic guy, right? Mm -hmm. We're not going to wait for the war to come to us. We're going to go and defend, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we're going to go head on and meet whoever it is that we need to meet. And we're not going to do it with, with a fiery you know, passion of you know, violence and vengeance, but with charity and truth. You know, with caritas and veritas, which I, I love also two great, you know, virtues of the society of Jesus. Tell me a little bit about that motion, like as he starts this order as uh, the focal point of what's going on, uh, obviously as a counter reformation, mm -hmm. but what's going on during the time of the reformation that moves them even more. Yeah, one thing I, I always point out to students is that the reformation essentially was an academic movement. Think about it, Martin Luther. Post his thesis yeah. basically in a college town. He's a college professor. A lot of the uh, the uh, the reformers you hear about were all university uh, lectures. So this is essentially a university movement. What happened? And so one thing that that, that kind of strikes me um, in in the front of the the Gregorian University, the first the original building, and I think it has it in the, in the new building now. There's written you know to the good to the sciences and arts, or what we call arts and sciences today. You know? In, yeah. uh, in college. And so what, what it was kind of revolutionary is like, let's use all of science and art that we have in the art at that time was a little bit just you know, more than, than what we know today. We're going to use these at the service of evangelization, all of them. We're not going to exclude anything. So whether it be astronomy, mathematics, rhetoric, poetry, painting, even sculpture, all of this, we're going to employ as our arsenal for, uh, for this counter-reformation that, that ends up happening. And so you see this explosion of art, even of uh, academic intellectual activity that is kind of fighting fire with fire. If this was coming in from an uh, intellectual uh, uh, environment, we're going to fire back exactly with that, with arts and sciences. This is the, the language of it. And so that becomes, uh, you can say, those tools that you have in creation in the world, how to best use them. OK, we're not going to direct it towards this end. And so um, Jesuit universities and schools started jumping up, appearing all over the place, just because, again, he said, this seems to be the best means to do it. Um, you mentioned, yeah, that Jesuits, we, we don't actually have any distinctive uh, uh, habits. Um, the, constant, the constitutions, the order just kind of says, we wear whatever the respectable clergy of the area wears. And so if it's this shirt, wear that shirt. If it's a cassock, wear the cassock. If it's a white cassock, you wear a white cassock. We don't have a standard one. In fact, you know, I've seen pictures of Jesuits. Are they're different types uh, in the east, uh, where Eastern Christians are? They've got uh, kind of the Byzantine or the Greek cassock. They wear the Byzantine Greek cassock. One oh. of the the um, the most notable ones was uh, uh, Matteo Ricci, was a Jesuit uh, missionary in the China, and he's always pictured wearing Chinese imperial robes. And again, as mm -hmm. a professor, as he was teaching, and there he couldn't dress as a foreigner because they wouldn't respect them there, and so he adopted. The, uh, of, uh, of what the people that did that job in, in China did. Another interesting one was uh, St. Francis Xavier, and, and you kind of work it out as, 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 as you go. And St. Francis Xavier, again, had gone to Japan wearing basically the, 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 the clothes of a beggar, as he had done already through Spain and, and, and part of India. However, he said he wasn't well received and nobody would pay attention. He said no one's going to pay attention to a beggar. So he had to do a little wardrobe change. Then he went in and got the fine silk and came in dressed as a, then all of a sudden everyone's paying attention to what he says. So uh, yeah, we hear like clothes make the man sometimes, <laughs> but uh, there is that flexibility in, in, in that and to adopt again, the best means, you know, uh, as long as they further the mission, that's what's important in it. So yeah, you'll find uh, a variety of, uh, uh, so, and it's not a one size fits all. I mean, certainly what works in the U.S. is probably not going to work in Latin America, which will be different what you do in Europe or in Asia and whatnot. You know, what, what, must have been, what must have been in his mind, you know, Ignatius, when he approaches the Pope and says, I, I want to be, you know, down and dirty, get, getting in there, educating and, and doing this mission in the church, you know, 
what was what was it like for Ignatius when he approached the Holy Father with this zeal and passion? Because I can imagine, like a, a pope during that time must have sat back and said, "Whoa, you're you got a lot of energy, <laughs> <laughs> slow it's, down." Tell me a little bit about that encounter right before he got the order approved. Yeah, actually, it, it, obedience is one of the uh, Saint Ignatius. The, you know, for him, he said of all, all the vows, obedience for him is the most important one, probably because he's the one he had to work on the most uh, <laughs> through his life. Uh, a couple of times, it shows up in his uh, uh, in his in his life, where um, yeah, he comes in with one plan, but the, the Lord has another plan, and he expresses it through the church and 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 uh, her bishops and even the Pope. And so the first one, perhaps, was uh, just a little after he had undergone his conversion. Uh, he and this was kind of the custom at the time. Again, with this whole de- uh, 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 new modern devotion and life, uh, kind of preaching and uh, individual itinerant preaching came into uh, into style. And so it was not uncommon that you'd find in city squares or or places a preacher, you know. And, he wasn't necessarily preaching something bad, but, you know, he was just basically preaching his personal experience out there and giving spiritual advice as well. They weren't priests yet. They weren't even religious. They were just, you know, kind of these just very uh, uh, religious uh, public speakers, if you will. And so Ignatius kind of follows on this and goes to Salamanca, which is a major university city in Spain, uh, a place where you study philosophy and theology. And he started preaching in the street. And uh, for most part, people say, actually, he's, he's pretty young. He's onto something. Some things probably need to be cleared out a little. <laughs> they didn't make too much sense. And so the Inquisition <laughs> gets a hold of him. And uh, they just, well, they do, yeah. they inquire, what exactly are you saying? And they recommend, you know what, before you go any further, why don't you take some theology and some philosophy and then go on your merry way? And uh, well, it, he had to comply because they said, if you don't, well, we're going to do what we're going to do. <laughs> You're going to get locked up. And so uh, that was his first probably run into He's like, well, I guess I have to study now. You can't just wing this. And then a second time happened when uh, he uh, wanted to, when he was on his pilgrimage. He, his idea was to go to the Holy Land and live in the Holy Land uh, originally, uh, before he thought of the Jesuits or anything of this. His idea was to go to the Holy Land and, well, like a knight, protect the pilgrims into the holy sites. And uh, when he was basically asking for his visa or the permission to get into the Holy Land, uh, they had a different idea. It's like, look, we got enough guys in here who think they know what they're doing <laughs> and they're causing yeah. trouble. No, permission denied. And uh, he actually goes in and they deport him <laughs> from the Holy Land. <laughs> and so a third time, uh, and this is when the foundation of the society comes in, he never abandoned the idea of going to the Holy Land. I mean, if it was for St. Ignatius's plan, I might be in Jerusalem now. I mean, the, his idea was to have this order to serve pilgrims in the yeah. Holy Land so he can be where Jesus lived, see what Jesus saw. And uh, when he presents his plan to the Pope for approval, he, 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 he kind of sa- he does present that. He says, we would love to go and serve in the Holy Land or wherever you find most fitting. And we put our, uh, our, 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 our obedience to whatever you decide. And the Pope says, let Rome be your holy land. You're not going to the holy land. You're staying here. And we need you here in Rome, and we need you in Italy, and actually we're going to need you in Europe. And that's exactly what happened. So um, kind of a, a, a school of hard knocks was going on in there with, uh, with St. Ignatius in uh, molding little by little his will to the divine will as it expressed through the church. And, you know, the best part is that how, how amazing – from that moment on, how many people started joining him quickly? Like, you know, he, he wasn't alone. I think within his first four or five years of starting his order, he was already at a good number, wasn't he? Yeah, it grew very quickly uh, in, in, uh, in, in the first years. And uh, so quickly almost that, that, you know, they had to put a limit on it because they, they weren't prepared for, uh, for so many. Um, a good number, not only of, uh, of seminarians, of, 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 of uh, young men interested in entering the order, and, but also a good number of priests already, already formed clergy, also entered the ranks of the Jesuits at that time and, and were missioning. So that might also help account for some of the early success that it had, that you already had, kind of had these four men heading out uh, to the missions. 
And, and who who would you, who would you say would be the the fathers of the Jesuit order? So we have Ignatius Loyola, who's the, obviously the founder. You already mentioned Francis Xavier, who basically became his collaborator, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Actually, he was in charge of the missions, wasn't he? Uh, he yeah, he's kind of the missionary by excellence. Uh, I see right. Francis Xavier. Yeah. And then who, who and, were uh, the other two that you mentioned? You've said four. There were some so. the, those are the big names. I mean, there are the yeah. uh, the. The original one's kind of the more spiritual father was uh, Father Pierre Favre, um, who was from Savoy in that border area of Italy and, and France. Uh, he was already, I believe, he was the first one to be ordained. And um, St. Ignatius knew that he said he knew the spiritual exercises better than St. Ignatius himself, he would say. <laughs> and they, yeah. it was interesting because he had confided in him or to give spiritual exercises when they were at the university saying, this guy's, you know, he, he, he this guy's got it better than me. So uh, that's one of the, it was known as the silent companion because it was also very quiet. Um, uh, he was, uh, canonized not too long ago. Part of that silence is that, uh, his, his place of burial got lost. It's believed that somewhere mm. below the Jesu, but, uh, there was a flood and sometime they, and it erased all the names. Of it, so nobody knows Good whose great. bodies who and down there. I volunteered to help do a little archeology, span but, um, uh, Pope Francis actually canonized. It was one of the first things he did as a Pope in his first year was uh, canonized uh, St. Peter uh, uh, of Harp. Another one was St. Peter Canisius, is uh, one of the uh, major figures, especially of the Reformation as well. He's known as kind of the, uh, the, the German apostle, even though he was actually Dutch. And uh, he, uh, he kind of gave that uh, German-speaking lands, that presence, and was a leader amongst them, even in, uh, uh, towards the Council of Trent. Um, you have others, uh, missionaries, also they're probably not, not as well known, but were amongst the original companions, Salmeron, Bobadilla. A number of them were actually Portuguese as well uh, in there uh, that, uh, that were sent out to India and, and uh, later on to the Americas as well uh, would be the other missionary area. How did it, how did, how were you struck? And that, tell me your story. I mean, like when you became, mm-hmm. when you decided to join the Jesuit order, out of all the religious orders out there, you know, why the Society of Jesus? What mm-hmm. struck you the most, Father? Well, it's kind of what all that I knew. So I went to the Jesuit school here in Miami. I'm a graduate and kind of back again serving in the school. And um, I also identify a lot with St. Ignatius of Loyola. And I would say it's not for nothing that uh, this feast that we're celebrating is actually the day before my birthday. And so when I, I mean, I didn't know that before, but once I entered the society and I started, you know, reading the autobiography of St. Ignatius and he remembers the day, May 20th of 1521, this is when uh, uh, you know I got the shot, and I looked and I was like, "Wow, this seems to be something that opened my eyes." And this happened like right on my birthday, pretty much, you know, five hundred years ago. But and uh, the more I look at his life, the more I actually identify with it because it had a lot of things in common. Um, the first thing was uh, the military. Is my original location. If you were to ask anybody from my from that was in school with me. To say where where where's Christian gonna go after all? Oh, he's going into the military. I wanted to go into the Naval Academy, and that actually started my application to the Naval Academy. You got to do that in eleventh grade, uh, one year before, and so um, I I was planning my life in the military. I mean, I still admire the military a lot. I actually helped out partially in in uh, in the type of chaplaincy in the Navy as well, and so the uh, the, the the military I think vocation we we share the same thing. St. Ignatius got shot in the leg and he had convalescence. Now, I didn't get shot, but my friend is the one who got an injury. He got in a really bad car accident uh, one year. And he was convalescing for about over four months. And um, yeah, while well, St. Ignatius got a, a shattered leg, my, my friend had a shattered spine, basically. I was with him uh, the whole time. And what do you end up? evaluating your life uh you know all this time he's bedridden we just kept on talking about life and what we're going to do you know we were 20 something at the time and uh i started evaluating my life as well and thinking about what were my motivations what i wanted to do and whatnot and so in a certain way i i i i see what he talks about that he had nothing that he was spending considering his life and being moved by these things so was i because at that same time, it was already the custom that for us to do spiritual exercises every year. But there was a one year I actually paid attention to what I was doing. <laughs> and uh, those three questions jumped up that uh, in one of the exercises, uh, uh, you're prompted to ask yourself, what have I done for Christ? What am I doing for Christ? And what am I going to do for Christ? What have I yet mm. to do for Christ? 
And so I think, well, the first two I can answer right away. Well, what have I done for Christ? Well, I'm a good son. You know, I go to mass every Sunday. You know, do good in theology class. Or, you know, <laughs> go, I'm on the, I'm on this retreat. You know, what am I doing for class or for uh, for Christ? Yeah, same thing. Uh, I'm going to this retreat. I pray. <laughs> you know, what do I still have to do for Christ? Ah, that's the question. And so I started reconsidering why, what I wanted to do. And so I, I had, you know, I was thinking of a military career a long time. And then the motivations came in. St. Ignatius was worried about how he was going to look in uniform after that. And that was, you know, he was given to the world. What were my motivations? Or what had I read? And he had read all the Knight's Tales and all that that, that, that inspired him. Well, 35 years ago, a movie came out. It's called Top Gun. <laughs> and I saw that movie. It must have been 100 times when I was a kid. I loved it. I, that's what I wanted to do. So that's the best uniform there is. I want to fly fast. I want to go far. I want to do, that's what I want to do. And so, you know, we, we don't have Knight's Tales today, but Top Gun was basically my Knight's Tale. I read that as a, that's what, I, I saw that movie, that's what I wanted to be. I was worried, yeah, that's the best uniform. What I wanted to be in the Navy, this has got a great uniform. It's got awesome ships, technology. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. You know? And so I reevaluated and said, okay, is this exactly serving God? Not that you can't serve God in those years. Certainly you can. And there are actually many saints that are examples of that. There are a couple of chaplains that have actually been uh, canonized. And well, some of the earliest martyrs actually were soldiers, Roman soldiers. And so mm-hmm. certainly you can serve God in the military. But I was thinking my own personal motivation, it wasn't, God was nowhere in that. It didn't factor anywhere in there. And so I had to reconsider that. And uh, when I started reconsidering, I was kind of thrown into a little bit of a, into a little crisis. You know, all my life I've been thinking, this is what I want to do. Now all of a sudden, no, what do I do now? And so uh, uh, graduation was coming up. I remember sitting in the hallway thinking about it, and just by casually. And I started wondering, I think it's like, you know what? That guy doesn't have to worry about answering this question. He already did. What am I going to do for Christ? All he has to do is wake up. His vocation is doing something for Christ. Mm-hmm. Could I do that? All right. That's when the spark got lit. My first answer was think of something else to do. <laughs> yeah. I spent eight years thinking about something else to do. Eventually, I ran out of excuses. And so um, after doing my own pilgrimage to uh, where St. Ignatius went, I went to Menoresa as well. I tried to find a cave as well to stay in it. <laughs> thinking, well, St. Ignatius did this. Well, it's going to yeah. work for me too. Yeah. Kind of what he said when he was reading the lives of the saints. If this worked for them, then it's going to work for me. And um, well, to make a pretty long story shorter, uh, the, uh, yeah, at the end of the day, I said, this is where, where God was. Uh, if I asked God where he wanted me to go, he said, well, here. The Society of Jesus as a priest in the Society of Jesus. So that's what I did. Finally, I had the guts to say yes in uh, 2002, entered in the bishop, and uh, yeah, it's been his, the rest is history. <laughs> so I, I have two questions to ask you that I was asked by friends about the, the Jesuit order. These are fun questions. We'll, mm-hmm. we'll kind of wrap up with this one, and then uh, you know we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how everyone can engage and connect uh, during the year of, uh, of the Ignatian year the 500th anniversary of his uh, uh, conversion. Question number one, what was Ignatius thinking with the silent retreat? Uh-huh. <laughs> it's the only way to do retreats. <laughs> silent oh, you know, retreat. Well, you know, because that- they, they ask, it's like, you know, I, I've been to one. It, uh-huh. It's the hardest thing in the world for an Italian to sit down for seven days silence. And, and I know some, some Jesuits would go longer. I mean, you know, you, you take away my speech, you take away communication and socializing. I get it, but it's like, why? I just figured I'd throw that in there. Well, I, for me, it's my favorite part of the retreat. But yes, I people tell me it's the hardest part, uh, and so uh, the uh, it is hard because we're we're surrounded by noise. And think about it, we need it. Like you know, you, people will turn on the TV in the room, not even look at it, just to have something you know playing in the background. We, we, Put radios in our cars we don't want to drive with nothing in it you know we'll put a talk show or whatever even if we're not paying attention to it and so we've got so much noise in the world and that noise does compete with the voice of god and sometimes that noise carries a message with the two that distracts us and so we've got to filter out and in silence is perhaps the best way we can do it start filtering out a lot of noise that we've got in our lives stuff that kind of drowns out even God's voice in there to finally hear it. Um, 
because once we finally hear God's voice, then we're going to recognize it in all the noise that's out there. And there's plenty of noise. And so the silent retreat is, is, is a way of getting rid of distractions to help you focus. Not only distractions of like, you know, TV or radio, but even interactions with others, you know, so that we're totally focused on one thing. Think about it. When you study something, if you're going to study seriously for something, you need silence. You know, you can't do it in front of the TV or uh, playing a video game at the same time. You've got to have silence and you got to be alone. So it's the same thing. It's the same principles there. And then here's the last question, which I know one of the most important things about silence is also uh, because the spiritual exercises are going on. And during that silence where you're reflecting out of all the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, which there are tons, which one's mm-hmm. your favorite? Oh, uh, I got to say, perhaps my, one of my favorite one, the one I love going, I look so forward to doing it is the uh, temptations in the desert. When Jesus mm. uh, is in the desert being tempted, uh, tempted by Satan, that's, that's perhaps one, because I, number one, I think we can all relate to it. We've all been tempted. And so to see Jesus also undergoing the same temptations that we go through in so many different ways, that helps me, number one, connect with Jesus in, in, in a very, in a very I, I'd say, personal, but in, in, in a very uh, intimate way. Uh, that he also confronts that devil. That devil dares to step in his way and to even take him off the path how many times does he do that to us how many times does the devil get in the way and try to veer us off the path it happens a lot more than we want to admit sometimes and so i like i I always like to stop and i was like all right if there's one part of christ's life that i can identify with for sure it's here because this happens a lot and so to go back to that and 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 to put it uh in in light of uh our own temptations all that's for me that's one of the, the 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 favorite ones to go to Oh, that's beautiful. I, I, I always enjoyed the super fast version, uh, the, but the mm-hmm. seven days, but I would love one day if I, if I ever have the energy and the time, you know, and the time, you know, with five kids, you really don't have time. Yeah. Right? But, you know, if I had time to sit down and do all 30, I mean, I love the, I have the booklet, you know, and I would love to do it. I've, I've been doing the examine, you know, every night mm-hmm. and I, I find it to be very fruitful in my own spiritual life to sit down and actually focus my, uh, on, what have I done and, and what can I do better and how I can make changes in the next day. And I pray my act of contrition towards the end, which I know is, is one of the many different things that, that happens during spiritual exercises for anybody who doesn't know about the Ignatius spiritual exercises. These are amazing exercises that you can involve in that really uh, does a self-evaluation and more than anything, it looks deep down in your life as the three questions that, uh, Father Christian, you mentioned, right, are, you know, what uh, what have I done, what am I doing, and what will I do uh, are great questions to look at. You know, how can I be the image of Christ for others? You know, I, I've been confirmed. I have the charisms to go out and be a living witness of the gospel to the ends of the earth. I've been to a World Youth Day, or I've been on a retreat, or I've, you know, I'm, I'm a faithful Catholic, and I'm trying to do my best. Like, that's great. Take opportunities to do a self-evaluation. Uh, a self-analysis, right? Uh, look deep down and and spend that time as Ignatius did to look at his life and see how he could have done, you know, what he needed to do to be as an effective person that he can be. It wasn't about the words more than the actions. I, I love the fact that the actions of St. Ignatius speak louder than his own words. Even though he, he you know, there's lots of words written it's his actions that really do we see the society of Jesus today. The effect of that is from the actions of this very small thing, uh, you know, of realizing that I, it's not about me anymore. It's about giving the glory to God and let him be the one, let him be the, the focal point. I love that. I love that. Uh, this, this year in the 500th anniversary of his conversion, what would you tell uh, an ordinary Catholic who's trying to figure out, oh, Jesuits, oh, schools, right? Forget that. <laughs> like, what would you tell an ordinary Catholic? How can you dis- rediscover? I-, I guess you could say rediscover because some people have heard about Ignatius mm-hmm. Loyola, but what can they do to rediscover Ignatius in this year? I, yeah. My thing is pilgrimage. I mean, you know, pilgrimage. Uh, pilgr- yeah. pilgrimage is the way to do it. Uh, it worked for him. Uh, he went, uh, you know, in Spain. I mean, there's an Ignatian way that goes from uh, 
from uh, Loyola down to Mandresa. Um, but yeah, I'm just like now, with, you know, <laughs> I don't know how feasible it is to do right now. I, I was able to do that one year uh, to to do that 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 uh, par, that, that par, partially walking it. But uh, it's it's a wonderful thing. I mean, you go through basically half of Spain in there. Um, but pilgrimage for me is would probably be it. If, if you if you ask me what to do, pilgrimage anywhere doesn't matter where it could be local. But that idea of taking off on your own, walking, there's a silence that comes with it automatically uh, with walking. And uh, yeah, you're forced to uh, think, reflect as you're going from one place to another. Um, certainly, that's what worked for St. Ignatius. Certainly, it's something that's part of Ignatius spirituality. I think it's a way of, uh, of tuning in. And well, we got plenty of places we could go to. Again, it doesn't have to be, you know, the place that St. Ignatius went to, we can't access that. But there are many places we can pilgrimage in our own country, right? maybe yeah. in your own state that you could go to. And even, uh, even pilgrimaging and then, to the cathedral, your your yeah. home parish of your diocese. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I, there, there's great graces and fruits in that, right? Mm -hmm. Indeed, local pilgrimage. I mean, I mean, there's people I've told you yeah, they'll do a pilgrimage off from their home to wherever the cathedral is, and however long that takes. And uh, yeah, they'll make a day out of it. And, yeah, you'd be surprised how far you can get on foot <laughs> when you actually put yourself <laughs> to it. Well, Father Christian, that, that is awesome because I, I love the idea of pilgrimaging. I mean, the whole point of what World Youth Day is, is the pilgrimage. And that's hopefully the focal point that people will take in, in light of what's happening in the world. Now that things are slowly reopening, take a pilgrimage. Take that opportunity to rediscover the lives of the saints, particularly Ignatius Loyola, in this Ignatian year that starts today, May 20th, 2021. Father Christian, it was such a blessing to have you with me uh, to share about Ignatius of Loyola. I always find a joy when I visit Rome to visit the tomb of Ignatius. When you said uh, that the Pope told him, stay here, we need you here. He, I mean, literally, he never left. He's still here. No, he's still here. <laughs> <laughs> you can visit the tomb of St. Ignatius of Loyola in Rome at the Jesu. It's a beautiful church located very close to Piazza Venezia. It, it's a must if you ever make it to Rome, a beautiful church. But moreover, you'll see the body of St. Ignatius Loyola uh, on the left side of the main altar. You know, I really appreciate your time. Uh, again, uh, for those of you guys who want to know more about the Jesuit order, there will be an information link on the bottom of this video uh, for you guys here. Father Christian, please uh, pray for him as he continue te teaches at the uh, Boynton Beach Seminary in Florida for not only diocesan priests, but I believe uh, priests from all over the area that you get that or, or seminarians who will eventually become priests from all over the area and uh, pray for him as he continues to do so and uh, pray for him because I believe in two years time, right? You'll be taking your final vows. God willing, you'll be oh, doing no. your final vows into the Jesuit order, which is a beautiful, beautiful ceremony. Again, from all of us at worldyouthday.com. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Father Christian. Please uh, uh, take advantage of this opportunity and your 500 year anniversary of the conversion of St. Ignatius in what we call the Ignatian year to take the opportunity and graces to learn and rediscover Ignatius. Thank you for joining me. God bless you guys and take care.